This is Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm Adrian Buskey. <laughs> Joining me in this episode is Isaac Marion, author of the Warm Bodies series, which views the zombie apocalypse from the unique perspective of one of the dead who is trying very hard not to be. The first novel, which was adapted as the 2013 film Warm Bodies, was followed by the prequel novella The New Hunger and sequel novel The Burning World. And now the series completes with the final book, The Living. Isaac, welcome to Fictitious. Good to be here. It's been a long road since the release of Warm Bodies, uh, which was a very popular novel and, again, had a, a popular movie attached to it. And, uh, and you've been working on the series now for probably the better part of 10 years? Yeah, pretty much nine and a half or so since I started it. So, yeah. So can you kind of tell us what Warm Bodies is about, the series overall, and then specifically the living, the conclusion that uh, just released? Yeah. So the series overall is basically the story of the main protagonist, R, is a sort of reluctant zombie who um, throughout the course of the series, he goes from being just kind of one of the one of the mindless mob to gradually kind of remembering what humanity is and what, what it's like to be alive. And he you know, is helped along in this process by this girl he meets, Julie, who they kind of fall in love and it becomes like his catalyst for, for coming back to life. But then that's kind of only the first step, like the, in, the, in the first book is him kind of reaching that point of, I remember what being alive is all about. And then is more, there's much more to it than that because not enough, you know, just be alive, have a pulse. Like he actually has to become a person and he has, he has to remember the context of his life. Like who did he used to be and how do you grapple with kind of a past that you don't recognize or don't relate to anymore. And, and then it expands kind of into this fairly epic scale adventure sort of thing where they're not just struggling with their own inner lives, but also kind of society at large where they have kind of this power vacuum when there's been a, an early stage cure to the, the zombie plague, which is kind of a mysterious metaphysical thing, not not the usual kind of viral phenomenon. And basically the old world is kind of sweeping back in to try to reset things back to you know, the old ways. And everyone else is like, that's what got us here in the first place. We've got to find a better way to, to run the world now that we've sort of reset to zero. And so it's kind of becomes this large scale struggle between these people who are kind of trying to push humanity into the next stage of evolution, metaphysically and societally, and then kind of the old guard trying to be a no, 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 back to the old, you know, security and business as usual stuff. And so it becomes kind of this, this grand scale conflict from inside and out. And so the living, you asked specifically that, is kind of like the culmination of all that. All the threads are tying together at this point. They have kind of, in, in the burning world, they find out who they are. They are remembers his past. He kind of understands how he fits into this whole playing field of the powers that be. And they figure out kind of what, what they have to do, basically, um, to redeem himself from, from his responsibility in the ruining the world and push through this, this resistance into the next step um, for society. So they're now kind of going back, back home, back to where they, they fled from before, where they're sort of being invaded. And now it's kind of like the final confrontation where um, all the big payoffs happen. So this is my favorite book in the series because it's kind of where it all comes together. It's where all the stuff that I've been setting up for all these books and all these years finally clicks and makes sense. And it's been frustrating to be stuck on the burning world for as long as I have because it is very much kind of a penultimate chapter. And it's hard to really talk about that book without the ending being in place because it's like, well, there's so much that's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So having this final chapter out there is just really exciting to have, be able to finally have some closure on the whole thing. I really like the thing that you've done with R over the over the series where like you mentioned just a bit ago that when R, the zombie character who's mostly the POV character, although as the books go along, we've get, you know, this this other kind of omniscient we that goes parallel to his story. But with R, you, you mentioned that he's a character who has this ambiguous past, something that happened pre his death and and that he doesn't remember as he develops into this new version of the nearlies, the nearly living, the nearly dead. And it's like sort of graduating out of zombie status into something kind of new. And I had this this moment that I felt like I had a, a, a kinship with R just today. So this is going to sound really weird, but bear with me. I made the reoccurring mistake of logging into Facebook. <laughs> 
And I got a notification from my like high school class from like 96. So it gives you some perspective on how old I am here because somebody had posted a video that was from like the 20 year reunion I didn't go to and it was on YouTube. And I was like, okay. And so I, I clicked it open and I glanced at it and it was like looking at a world I didn't remember anymore. People that I don't talk to that I'm not, you know, affiliated with in any way that I have no, I have pretty ambivalent feelings about in general, but it's like, I don't even remember it fondly. It's like, it's not even really a big part of my life. And so I had this weird moment of seeing things that were part of my definite past, but also felt inconsequential or even like something I didn't necessarily want to revisit. And so now it's not nearly as dramatic as what R is going through as his uh, his memories reveal themselves and it's, as he's realizing that he has a much bigger stake and part to play in this, this huge history of the world. But it definitely gave me this feeling of like, oh yeah, it's really weird when the past comes back and it's like, oh, hey, here's this thing that doesn't feel like part of you now, but it still in some way matters. When you were putting him together and figuring out that character, especially in Warm Bodies, the first novel, were you aware of that backstory then? Did you know that was happening or did that kind of come after the fact, after the first novel? Well, I had I had the basic picture in my mind. Like it's kind of, it's hinted at in Warm Bodies, uh, his outfit. And there's sort of, he has little flashbacks of vague memories of, of some kind of life in a position of power of some kind. And so like I had the broad strokes of that in my mind writing that um i you know i'm not going to reveal exactly which plot points i had planned and which i didn't cuz that can <laughs> do nothing but but ruin the experience but i mean i had the general general idea and i think you know like you said that it's such a fascinating thing to me that i find that i experience that all the time where any nostalgia any recollection of even like a year ago sometimes it just feels like i have no connection to what the versions of me that came before and in my life in particular, I mean, much of, I didn't do anything, anything as horrible as, is ours past, but like I look back on my history and I, I've changed so much. I used to pretty much be fighting for the exact opposite team as far as ideologically, sociologically. I mean, I, I came from a very hard conservative background, fanatical religious stuff and, and remembering, you know, even as a semi adult, you know, late teens, early twenties and, uh, Think, remembering how I used to think and like the the ideas that I was pushing for and how it's so bizarre to me that I feel like me and that person have nothing to say to each other. It's like I, we would get in a huge fight. And it's remarkable to me that even without some undead amnesia, that can happen. And it's just like, that's what life feels like to me. But so the, the arc of this story is kind of like him coming to grips with that past and figuring out like, I can't deny this. I can't just pretend that that I'm a brand new person, which is kind of how Warm Bodies ends, where he's like, I'm going to start a whole new life. I don't want to know my old name. I don't want to know who I was. But that's like not how it works. You don't have that option. So he quickly finds out like there has to be some grappling with who I used to be and find some way to make peace with that and incorporate that into who I am now. Well, I think it's also interesting when you look at the other like main characters of the story, if you look at R's companions and you have Julie, like you mentioned earlier, the love interest from the first novel, who is the other kind of like major protagonist of the story, along with with R in this journey and his doorway back into humanity. Uh, but you also have Nora, her best friend, and you have M or Marcus, who is another one of the, the zombies who basically comes awake alongside uh, or right after uh, R and has been his his best friend in death and and then into a new version of life. All of those characters have a certain element to them where they are living their best life in the present to a degree, but all of them have a certain level of pain to look back on. Anytime Julie reflects too hard on the past, you know, she sees the loss of her parents and she sees the loss of the world around her. And Nora has even sort of effectively blanked out some of a difficult past, but we discover some of it in um, the novella, uh, The New Hunger. When you're constructing those characters, how do you balance that present day optimism with a past that's always just biting at their heels in a really uncomfortable way? I see it as kind of like there's a parallel with the way that they are approaching their own lives and the way that they're approaching kind of the world at large, they, there's kind of this, this recurring idea that the apocalypse has happened. Society has been obliterated. Basically, like the worst case scenario has already happened. And now they're in the aftermath and they're figuring out like everything is broken. Everything is ruined. We're sitting here like with the broken pieces in our hands. Do we just give in to the despair of that and like disintegrate along with everything else? That's one option. That's what most people are doing in this world. Or do we just get pissed and fight back and like push beyond what even makes sense 
as a rational person and just like believe that there can be something better. And so that's kind of the approach that they're all taking in some way. They're taking that towards the world and that they're thinking like, we're not going to go back to, you know, the old ways that got us here in the first place. There has to be some, some new way to approach this, something out there that we can grasp onto. And so but in that same philosophy, they're kind of applying to themselves where they've already kind of been through the worst of it. They've seen their families destroyed. They've seen, you know, horrible, horrible things that have not quite broken them. And they've held on and survived through that. So now they're kind of like, they're on the other side of that, where they're, they're trying to push through that trauma and like rebuild themselves into something better, even though, um, because like they kind of have the opportunity, everything's been stripped away. There's a few scenes in, in the living where they kind of talk about that, where like the path that they were on before these things happened wasn't necessarily going to take them to a good place. Like the, you know, Julie was this entitled spoiled brat and like just people were on this certain path and then horrible things happen and it kind of rocks their world and it resets them in a way, which is kind of what happens with R in a very literal way. His mind is wiped and he gets a new chance to start over. So there's kind of a lot of conversations about what that means to start over, even while having memory of your past, you can kind of get this jarring life events can push you onto a new path that can end up taking you to a, to a better place. You've mentioned on social media in the past that even though the living was actually finished um, and ready to go quite some time ago, the events in it and the commentary in it um, have been fairly prescient about the way things have gone in our sociopolitical landscape in the years since. R has given you this really interesting viewpoint in order to explore ideas of humanity, but how does it feel to like see some of the more difficult elements of your fiction play out in real life? And do you get a sense from your own explorations in the story of like where the bright spots are? Yeah, that's been very surreal to watch that unfold. I mean, I I wrote the last page of the last book, the series, I think early 2016, maybe maybe 15. I was basically wrapped up with it. And I, I didn't add any major plot points since then. It was just editing. So a lot of the stuff that at the time that I wrote it, I was basically looking at some of the patterns that are going on, some of the, the momentum that I've seen in society and just kind of imagining the extreme end of that, where the world would end up if we just kept going down all these paths. And a lot of it is kind of big, broad stuff, like everyone knows the environmental disaster that's coming and things like that, which is sort of one part of the the apocalypse scenario, but um, there were a lot of some of the finer details that I that I peppered in there as world building of, of you know how they got to this point that ended up uh, happening in the real world in a very specific literal way. And uh, I can't certainly not like a pleasant feeling. There's no I told you so or anything. <laughs> but uh, for a while it was kind of fascinating. I mean I, I remember it's, it's hard to talk about this stuff. Like it, I didn't write the book to be like overtly political. It's not like it, but it looks that way when you read it now. It's like, oh, this is obviously Trump and this is obviously this. And like Trump was just kind of a, a twinkle in Satan's eye at the time that <laughs> that I was finishing this up. <laughs> but then, you know, suddenly we have in the story, there's a narcissistic businessman who uh, basically takes over the government and becomes the head of apocalyptic corporation that is that is driving the world back towards this conservative dystopia. And, and I'm like, wow, that's a bit on the nose. But I didn't know. <laughs> and, you know, he's got the border walls. And there's even in more recent times, like, I didn't even notice it until this last editing passed. But there's stuff, with, you know, like families being separated and kids put in cages. And I was like, Jesus Christ, I, this is like, distasteful now, but it's already written. And so, yeah, I put a disclaimer in the book just because I felt like I had to mention that, that I'm not just like watching the news, waiting for the, the latest atrocity to happen so that I can write a scene about it because it feels gross. But it's kind of like, it, it is what it is. And I, you know, I, I don't, I don't consider it like a cautionary tale and then I'm some prophet or something. I guess there's been moments where I thought, you know, all the stuff that I'm writing, it seems to be happening. But in the end, like this is actually a pretty optimistic story. Like um, a lot of really dark stuff happens in it, but like ultimately, it's not the typical dystopian scenario where it's all about like, ooh, warn you, don't don't get down down this path because here's how you end up. It's like we go there, but then I feel like you need to go a step further than that. Otherwise, why are you wasting my time? I know stuff is shitty. I don't need the reminder of that everything is bad. Contribute at least a hint of an idea of how it could be better. And so I'm kind of hoping, you know, 
if this part is prophetic, maybe this other part can't be too. Maybe there's some glimpse of the scenarios that I imagined in a more hopeful light that could possibly become real too. So fingers crossed. Well, I really like that you, beyond that, I enjoy that there is an optimism to the outlook of those novels, but I like that you bring that up because uh, in general, like the world that's like zombie fiction and stories and games and stuff outside of say like The Last of Us, which I think is a, like a brilliant video game that explores zombies from interesting fashion. Like I'm not a big fan of like The Walking Dead and a lot of other stuff that's out there. It's not generally like a sub genre that I get into very often. But I mean, I discovered the Warm Body series because of the film. I read the book first, but it's like I did that thing where I, I read the novel and I was really taken taken with the fact that it's got this sardonic sense of humor. It's, I, I, maybe it's fair to call it a dry sense of humor because R is not overtly funny, but his his observations of the world, he sees the absurdity of living amongst the, the dead and this bizarre existence that they live and then encountering humans, finding just how exactly absurd humans are in their living state. Tonally, I feel like the, the series gets more serious as it goes along. And maybe it's also sometimes when there's a film of something, you know, that can really capture your remembrance of a story. If you've experienced both things, like, you know, because you have the power of all those visuals and music and all that stuff that goes on top of it. As you were writing the series and finding that, you know, as you got beyond warm bodies, which is, I guess, you could almost call it like a paranormal romance to a degree because it is, you know, driven by this romantic plot in it. But it turns into an epic tale of apocalyptic survival and then sort of like a new renaissance of what humanity is. How do you handle that tone? And was that something that like you found just happened naturally? Were you making a conscious decision to to adjust it as you went along? And how have people reacted to that? Well, the contrast between particularly with the the perception of the tone, which is, like you said, much informed by the movie, it's it's something that kind of continuously amuses me. And I, it's a problem, but I also kind of like it cracks me up imagining what people must think going from the movie to, you know, the burning world or something where it's just like, it's such a radical shift. And in the books, it's not as radical of a shift because the first book was already kind of tonally different from the movie. But it, you're right. I mean, it definitely was a simpler, kind of sweeter story. Very little actually happens in Warm Bodies. It's not very plot centric. It's kind of just this. It's a very slim book too. It's like self contained little little story. But I think that there's humor throughout it. But in Warm Bodies, it's kind of like flipped from the movie. I would say the movie is like mostly comedy with some elements of, of drama and, and poignancy. And the book is sort of the reverse of that, where it's I, I consider it mostly serious, but there's lots of dark comedy in there as well. And that shifts to some extent just because the joke is done. Like the, the, the whole high concept premise of like the main character is a zombie. You can only ride that so far. Right, so yeah. like <laughs> I felt like I pretty much got most of the zombie jokes out of my system by the time I was finished with Warm Bodies. So when I decided, you know, I'm going to keep can tell the rest of this story. It's like, okay, I'm not just going to keep making dead jokes. Like it, it, <laughs> an intentional dad joke, <laughs> but, uh, the comedy kind of moves from the premise into the actual interactions. I think that it's more in the dialogue and kind of the way that characters interact more than, than just like wry observations on the state of the world, because most of those are kind of over at that point. Also just the stakes are much higher. Like it, it they're most of warm bodies is just about R and Julie hanging out and there's not really a threat to anyone else until like the third act basically and, and at that point you know in the book and the movie the humor pretty much disappears at that point in the story because you know now there's action and threats going on and, but from the bulk of it it's kind of just like this little funny hangout <laughs> so moving into the burning world you know the situation gets much more dire like they're they're now being hunted their people are dying they're kicked out of their home they're like desperate they're wounded and and there are traumatic events happening and so the tone just kind of inevitably has to shift to allow that stuff the space that it needs like i'm not really a fan of um that kind of relentless concern for deflating dramatic moments with with punchlines like let the let the drama sit for a minute before you kill it i think there's kind of a, an ethos in a lot of pop pop culture fiction these days like don't let anyone don't get too heavy you know like don't let anybody feel anything for too long or else they're going to get squeamish you got to like cancel it with a joke right away. So I try to not, you know, the, the jokes come, but like, I want to give the moments the, the space they deserve to actually sink in and then, and then I'll lighten it up. So it's just sort of inevitable that over the course of that story, you know, it, 
there's a transition point because towards the end of Warm Bodies, it gets more serious and quite a bit more serious by the very ending. And then by the time Burning World picks up, it's kind of like if you're reading the whole series, you probably acclimated to that more serious tone. But yeah, I mean, it, it gets pretty damn dark. And so that was kind of a question at times of like, I don't want to totally lose lose that brightness because that was part of what I loved about the whole story is that like, you know, zombies are ridiculous. It's a ridiculous monster. <laughs> it's generally goofy throughout most of pop culture. And that was kind of the whole reason that I was attracted to the idea was that I wanted to explore these, you know, heavy, dark themes in a way that wouldn't be so heavy and dark. Using zombies as kind of the vehicle for that uh, have to allow the goofiness of them to come out. So like when they are in, in company do encounter zombies again. That's kind of the moment where they get to have their weird little bumbling exchanges and, and it gets a little, a little more childlike at times, but I don't know. I just kind of had to take the tone where it was going. Well, I appreciate too, that like with Nora and Marcus, you do have characters that bring levity to it. M in particular is, is very funny and all of his interactions and Nora is kind of a smart ass and, and occasionally that comes off very crass, but it, it's important for her to be that way based on her background, but it's still, it's very, so you do have those light moments, but I know what you're talking about as far as like, I would think of it as much as I love the films, it's kind of like the Marvel method, like Marvel films are really big on giving you big dramatic moments and then hitting you with a with a one-liner that kind of cracks the tension and lets the audience breathe again and um, yeah. it can be very fun in a film but can also sometimes like you said just kill the tension that you were building that you're working so hard to build to yeah and i think it it works with marvel movies i think for that for that level of of entertainment it it's appropriate i don't think that people are are going to go to you know a superhero movie expecting to like really have an emotional crisis and i kind of wish that we could do that because like, I don't find the need to treat genre material as, as light. I would be happy to see like a heavy psychological superhero movie, but there's not really a tolerance for that in culture as we know it. So like, I get it for, for things like that. I think it's probably the right move. It's a blurry line and it's subjective, but for me, I would love to just push the, the needle a little bit further to where moments in, in big pop culture that just they horrify me sometimes, like in um, Force Awakens, you watch, what is it, like 12 planets be destroyed, and it, there's a pause of like three seconds, and then a sword fight, like not even a moment of, of silence for like billions of people just dying. And I was like, wow, this is where we're at. Like We cannot handle even just a breath of, of depth before back to the action. So I'd like to, you know, if I'm in control of the work, I'm writing the book, I'm going to give more space than that that maybe a little more than people are comfortable with in, in what they assume is going to be popcorn. I think you're in an interesting position as an author who's had their work adapted to the screen because it really does have an impact on how the larger pop culture landscape remembers your work or views your work um, because there's far more people who watch movies than there are that read books, unfortunately, these days. And I also, I mean, I think that like, again, like I was saying earlier, it can kind of color like the way you remember something. Like, I think sometimes it might be difficult for people to remember that like that the R of the book doesn't look or necessarily act like the R of the film. Like you've got this hoodie wearing kind of almost looks like he would be sort of a teenage slacker version of, of the character in the film versus the book where he's dressed in a suit and he has a tie. And as we learn, as time goes along, that's a significant thing. The R of the novels is, is very dangerous, you know, like to his own surprise, he's like very physically adept in combat situations. Is that a challenge from, from the standpoint where you're at, like in that unique position as somebody who has been adapted to like remind people of like, we're in the book universe. So the, remember, this is who this character is. And, um, you know, do you run into people who kind of have blurred that line in their head as far as like, what's yours and what was the adaption? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a huge struggle. And it's been going on, you know, since the movie came out, basically, even with even with Warm Bodies itself, but much more so with the rest of the books in that, you know, even for me, when I when I started writing the rest of those books, it took me a while to kind of like purge the movie versions of the characters from my yeah. head. Because when I first started, I was, you know, I was picturing those actors, and I was hearing their voices. And I'm like, they're close in, in a lot of ways, but there's some key differences that I need to remind myself of and like, you know, refresh my own my own memory. But that was a brief transition. And then my hope is that by the time people get, you know, a few chapters into the burning world, it sort of reasserts itself somewhat. And at least by the time it starts to matter, people will probably be back in that zone. But it's less of a concern for when people are reading and more about just like getting them to read it. Because 
I'm not, I, I've, I've rarely encountered a pop culture object that has a bigger discrepancy between how it's perceived at large and how it actually is. I think that some of the places that these books show up promoted are just so head spinning bizarre to me. Like it will be <laughs> a bunch of pictures of like shirtless men with glistening abs and then the living, my weird psychedelic sociological nightmare. <laughs> like, <laughs> how did this get here? Like, there's just so much confusion about where it belongs in the, the, the categorization of, of genre and, and, and audience. It's, you know, once people, people who actually read the books have no choice but to accept what they are, but it's, it's the public perception and, and, you know, especially like meeting people and talking about it and like trying to promote it and trying to treat it like the thing I think it actually is at the extreme pushback from what everyone else thinks it is. You know, it's that, that Zom rom-com, you know, it's like, yeah. that's that funny, you know, teen comedy. And I'm like, <laughs> well, we've got a lot of, you know, people, oh, I'm going to buy this for my 12 year old son. I'm like, you really shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> fairly adult. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's, I, I don't really know what to do with that. It's been one of the big struggles of, of my whole promotional life is trying not to be too defensive about that. I don't, I don't literally want to tell people like, don't buy my book. <laughs> if you <laughs> think it's, you know, if you think it's going to be this, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But then I've also got a lot of people who, who thought it was going to be dumb and were pleasantly surprised because they actually do like not dumb things, <laughs> but they thought they were, you know, going to do some some popcorn fluff, and then they were pleasantly surprised by by some depth. So there's a flip side to it too. I have basically just backed out of it in general. There was a time when I was out there kind of campaigning to set the record straight about what I was actually trying to write, but there's pretty much no way to do that without sounding really pretentious and defensive, <laughs> and, and it's just like you put your foot in your mouth. So. I kind of have resigned myself to like the most of the world is always going to think of this series as that popcorn rom-com and it gets more and more weird and, and trippy and intense as the series goes on. And the, the contrast between, you know, how this story wraps up these like lofty heights that it goes to and all the, you know, psychological pain involved. And then thinking about those people reading that, it's just how they're going to contrast to it. It kind of, I've, I've decided to be, to enjoy it. Like it kind of amuses me at the imagining the shock. And then once in a while, I'll hear from people who confirm that that they were shocked. And I'm like, I told you, yeah, <laughs> is what it is. I've pretty much given up on trying to be perceived as cool. I just put the books out there and hope that people will give them a chance and and they can make their make up their own minds. The copy of Warm Bodies that I have is the film cover. And it certainly looks like a YA romance, you know, like, so I think that like by, yeah, I mean, I get why people would have that perception issue, but I would imagine that one of the things beyond just the overall tone of the series that people would probably be surprised by is the eloquence of your prose, because you have a very, I mean, people describe it all the time as like very lyrical or poetic. And, and I mean, I think that's a really good way of describing it. You have a very distinct writing style and like I, as a reader, I tend to slow down reading something when I really enjoy it because I like to savor the words. I like to reread passages. Like I don't, I don't speed read through things. And that is very much the case when I read your stuff because you do have a great deal of craft. As you're writing something, are you somebody who like tears through a first draft quickly? Do you write slowly? And, and does that like poetic nature of, of the, the prose come out naturally in the beginning? Or is it something that you kind of labor over? Like what's that process like? I write extremely slowly for that, for that reason. And people keep telling me like, just get the first draft out and then refine it later. But I, I find it really difficult to move on from even just a paragraph before I feel like it's at least mostly there. So I tend to kind of edit as I go. And the style of the, of the prose, like I do spend a lot of time tinkering with, with pretty much every sentence because the way that I try to write it, it's all kind of interconnected. There's a rhythm to not just a sentence, but that whole paragraph and also to like how it fits into that page and the chapter at large and stuff. So I kind of have to go step at a time. It's like, if you're, if you're playing a song, you can't play the last line first and then, you know, fill in the middle and it, you know, music is sequential by, by its nature. And so I'm also a musician and I kind of approach writing in, in pretty much the same way where it's like, I have to, I have to know what the rhythm of this line is in order to know where the next one starts. And so I kind of have to get it semi-finalized before I can move on to the next. So it takes me a long time. I mean, there are moments when I do just 
blow through it and it just kind of comes out and it, depending on the type of scene like not not every section is super lyrical it's like an action scene or something that it can kind of just flow freely but like for the the really poetic passages i all sometimes just have to sit there and polish it for the entire day I'll, I'll write a single paragraph and i just think like well call it a poem or something like it's sort of it's a, a i consider it accomplished if i got a paragraph done definitely held me back as far as prolificness um a lot of people that i that i meet at like at conventions and conferences and they write multiple books a year and i'm just completely flabbergasted by that because it took me four years to to finish burning world and and the living and then more years after that of, of editing so for me it's like it would have been very good for me if i could have turned those out quickly while the movie was still hot and everyone was telling me like, now's your window. You got to do this now. And I'm like, I can't, I just have to do it when it happens. I, I can't, I can't speed this up. And so I didn't. <laughs> and here we are. I did a, a panel uh, last year at Emerald City Comic Con that included Patrick Rothfuss, who's a big name in the fantasy world. And, uh, yeah. and he, he made a comment on that panel that he'd had a conversation with Brandon Sanderson, who's also a very notable fantasy author. And he was talking about how Sanderson's one of those guys that kicks out two or three books a year. Like he's just, you know, he's a machine. And then Rothfuss is, is known for being painfully slow. Like he has these huge doorstopper novels that are beloved in fandom, but he's got two and a half books out or something like that over the course of his career. But yet he's still very notable. He might actually be slower than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of, of, of that series. I've been waiting years for the, the last uh, name, name of the wind book to come out. But, but yeah, he's uh he may, he's got me beat him and George Martin are, yeah. <laughs> are leading the pack in slowness, the reverse race. What he said was that like Sanderson had said, well, look, he's like, I'm a flow writer and you're a language writer. So Sanderson is all about getting those those words on paper fast, getting something like tightly put together. But like he's not that concerned about like the beauty of the prose. He's all about how like the the story progresses, the plot, the characters and things, all the things that matter. But the well, language isn't his key thing, whereas like Rothfuss labors over it. And I think very much the same way you're talking about where like there isn't a paragraph in his book that isn't labored over three times as much as probably a lot of other writers do that write faster. So, yeah, I get what you're saying. You are a language writer. Like that is very much like that's clear on the page. And so it doesn't surprise me that your process would be slower. It's really interesting how like two different worlds of writing and you can focus on one or the other and, and you can be have, write a great book with even just one of those two. Like there are many books that I've enjoyed a lot that basically are just the, the words are just there to to get the story across. They're just a medium for for events. But if the story is really compelling, it has interesting characters and like there's some some fascinating hook to it, I'll still love it. And there's also the reverse occasionally where a book is just has no plot and it's just meandering, whatever, but it, it has such beautiful writing that I still love it because it's like poetry, basically. I mean, I appreciate the, the beauty of the imagery. And of course, my, my favorite books are always where they have both. And that's a lot to ask, I think. And, and I'm sure many people strive for that. Although I, I feel like a lot of a lot of popular authors kind of eschew that whole idea. I hear in, in, in interviews a lot of times people are like, Language, language, <laughs> just, like, <laughs> just about story. And so I think maybe some people, either they never tried for that or they kind of just reached a point of frustration where they're like, you know what, fuck all that purple shit. <laughs> I'm going <just> <laughs> to tell my tale. I don't disrespect that. But I, I'm definitely striving to do both. I do have a harder time oftentimes when it's just one or the other, um, particularly like the prose has to be pretty incredible if there's no story. And so story is very important to me. I'm not the kind of writer who's just like pure moods. You know, I, I want I want there to be something happening, but I wouldn't even know how to write it in pure technique. That's how people make all their money is by the, the very effective, uh, propulsive prose. But that just it's not a language that I know. You know, you said like Warm Bodies is is not necessarily a book where like it's super plot heavy because it's more emotionally based but the follow-up novels have a lot going on so i mean you have both that strong you know language that like that that power of the prose but i mean there's big events and a lot happening and a ton of action and so i mean like i think that i think you found that balance very well as as the yeah. series went along there's a car chase 
Yeah. I never thought I'd be riding a car chase. <laughs> a car chase with a flamethrower. Right. Yes, exactly. A car chase with flamethrower and, and guns and, and uh, you know, you've got yeah. planes and helicopters and uh, a very particular, very visceral death of a minor character with uh, with helicopter rotors and stuff. I mean, yeah, there's a there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. You know, going back into into craft here, um, what is your process for for outlining are you do you do rigid outlining are you a pantser is it a combination of the two like what what's that method for you it depends on what i'm writing like with short stories i don't plan at all it's just i just go um with one novel that i wrote in my early 20s i didn't have any outline and and it basically if something doesn't have much of a plot i can i can pants it but anything that has a lot going on i i need to to know where it's heading i don't the stephen king method doesn't work for me and i don't know if it always works for stephen king either where he just kind of <laughs> dives into it and sees where it goes yeah I, I don't write an outline per se but i i basically do the cliff notes version of the whole story i just kind of write in a very blunt form what's going to happen and i in that in the process of writing that out it kind of fills my head with the images of it i get kind of a, a little preview of what that scene is going to feel like and i sort of store it away for for later but I find that planning the, the story events is the hardest part. It's the scariest part. It's the part that you don't really know if it's going to work. You don't know if the ideas are going to happen. And you can get stuck on plot points where there's no apparent solution. And so that part is so taxing to me. It, it takes so long and, and there's really no way to force it through that I find it's just too much to ask in my brain to do them both at the same time because writing the prose is also another huge exertion. I find that when I try to just wing it, it's so much, it's like I'm, I'm building the road in front of me as I'm driving. And it's just like, I don't know what's going to happen. It's coming and it's uh, very stressful. So I like to kind of get, do this rough draft of the general events and then go back and, and distill it in, fill all the color in, because that's, that's the fun part for me is actually writing the prose. When I, if I know what the scene is going to be. Like I wake up that morning thinking, okay, this is the scene where this thing happens. Then I can start to contemplate it as I, you know, walk to the coffee shop and, and, and I'm just, I'm ready to dive in. I, I don't, I'm not worrying about what's going to happen when I get there because it's already in my head. And so that I can just free myself up to unleash the language. And that's how I like to do it. I still would like to try to try the other method again sometime soon. I think maybe the next book I write might have a lot less organization just because it's, the next two or three books that I'm doing, I'm not going to be super plot heavy. So I'm looking forward to kind of letting that loosen up a little bit because it's pretty stressful trying to manage all those all those elements, especially over a four book series. I don't think I'll ever do a series again. <laughs> In your method for managing all that stuff, um, is there a particular software you use? How do you do your note taking? Do you do anything on paper? What's your method? No, I just have a document and I just type it out like as if it's, as if I'm writing a book, but it's instead of beautiful prose or whatever it's like r goes here he shoots this guy and like it's very blunt <laughs> like fifth grade book report sort of uh writing level just to kind of get a lot of times it it the, the act of writing it out in that form kind of generates the where it's going to go like i'll come into it with only a very loose idea of where the scene's going to go and then as i'm writing the description it kind of reveals itself to me then i take that description and you know use it as kind of a rough map to when I do the actual writing, but it's all pretty loose. I mean, oftentimes the map that I write out ends up completely changing along the way. So I'm not, I'm not bound to it. Sometimes things completely reconfigure, but it's nice to have you know something to go on. I really like that you said uh, the like the fifth grade book report. I did a panel years ago with a writer where she mentioned this methodology that she had stumbled across, which was um, that had really helped her out, which was basically approaching her like the novel the first time through the outlining process like they were writing a children's book writing this very simple like strip out all the fancy language strip out like all the extra descriptions and whatever and just boil down to just the pure plot points like you would write like in a middle readers book or something like that i i've never been able to track down whose methodology that is but i always thought that was a really interesting concept as a way of looking at like getting out of your own way you know because we sometimes will get so caught up in context of things that we need to just get kind of down what the story is so i mean i think that your your fifth yeah. grade book report works works along that i that line yeah i mean i hadn't really thought about it in, in in that in that term but it's basically the same same idea and it it 
makes a lot of sense because then if you're making sure you have a compelling story, because it has to build it, if it can't stand without the language, it's maybe not a great story. So when I'm writing it without the language where it's just really dumb, like R feels sad. <laughs> I mean, I just, it is like reading to a child. I just kind of give a very simple glimpse of, you know, what the emotion of that scene is then that I can look over that and be like, okay, does that work? And if it does, then I can go back in and like build the the complexity and nuance on top of that. But it's like, that's the, that's the skeleton that holds it all up. There's uh, something that you've been very open about in your blog and on social media and stuff too, which was that there was a challenge in, in getting to the point of publishing the living. And I think the publishing landscape has changed so much in the last 10 years, the rise of, of things like Amazon and, and the ebook world and um, the, the fact that indie publishing is now viable in a way that it was not in the past. And in fact, I know, I know far more indie authors who are actually making a full living off of their work than published authors. I know a ton of people that are published by the big publishing houses that still have day jobs versus indie authors that are writing five books a year somehow that are getting it done. You went through a pretty challenging series of events with uh, with the Warm Bodies series. Can you kind of just, I don't want to belabor it, but like briefly kind of walk through that and how you came to where you're at with it now? Yeah, well, basically... Warm Bodies was a huge hit. It had to be. I mean, it was it sold decently before the movie came out, but no matter what, a movie is going to take that to the next level. So it sold a lot of copies. There was a certain expectation of what the next book would be, how it would sell. And the publisher of Warm Bodies was you know, a very large, very mainstream commercial publisher who uh, you know may or may not have been the appropriate house for a story like that, but they, they took it because they, there was a movie coming out and they thought this will take care of itself basically. Uh, and it did, but then came time for another book without a movie behind it. It's a very different scene. So me and my agent have debated endlessly on like what exactly went wrong. And there, there was, everyone was pretty surprised um, when I released Burning World, which was, you know, technically the third book, The New Hunger didn't sell super great, but no one really expected it to because it's, you know, it's a novella and it's a prequel and it was, is a sort of, um, you know, it is a kind of integral part of the, of the story, but it's not the sequel and it's not the continuation that everyone's waiting for. So it seemed like its sales were within range of expectation. And then we're all thinking like the sequel this is what everyone's waiting for. I want to know what's happened, what happens next. And, and so this will be a big deal. And uh, it came out about a month after Trump's election, uh, the entire media landscape was completely buried in political mayhem. Oh, it's just a disaster. Yeah, that was actually, you know, it wasn't just me. It was a, a tsunami that sank quite a few books that were meant to be a big deal. There's a whole article about it. And I think Forbes or, or New York Times or some, some major thing that is legitimate that um, said like what happened that year to all, a bunch of books that were supposed to be phenomenons and they just nobody even saw them because 99% of the media bandwidth was taken up by by politics and it kind of became the new show that everyone was watching and so that was certainly a factor I, i'm not placing all the blame on that but basically you know burning world sold laughably small for, but compared to warm bodies it you know of course we expected it to be less because without a movie it's not going to be in the same same sphere but it was like one percent of what warm bodies sold oh wow which was bizarre because like both warm bodies and burning world got good reviews like there has high star rating on amazon there's actually there's more five star ratings of warm bodies than there are people who bought the sequel to warm bodies so there are more people who love that book than than bought the sequel so it was some kind of perfect storm of of events converged there to just totally tank this this book and so you know, my big, big commercial publisher was like, well, obviously we're not publishing the next one because this one didn't sell. And I kind of get it. Like the math is, is not in my favor. I kind of had hoped that they would make a little, little more effort to try again. And like, they didn't really do much promotion either. So there was a lot more that could have been done, but, but they dropped it basically. And so, you know, I was suddenly homeless I was out there with no publisher and um, a completed book, which is the, the completion of the series and uh, kind of assumed that it would be whatever their, their short sightedness was would not be present elsewhere that I would find like a, a smaller, weirder publisher who would be like, see the opportunity of saying, Oh, this, you know, 
your first book sold hundreds of thousands of copies. The next one sold 3,000. Something clearly has gone wrong. Yeah. We should probably build a sixth that and capitalize on it, considering that the reviews are good. I mean, if it was just a bad book that no one liked, I could take my failure and, and move on. But the fact that people really liked the book and it still dropped so hard was just like puzzling and, and frustrating. And so what I found is that even the small publishers, a lot of them liked the book. They said they would like to be able to publish it, but they, because of the awkward situation that the book was in being the fourth book in a series where another house owns the first three, a lot of them, they just said like, we, we don't have a model for this. Like we can't, we can't publish an orphan book in a series without being able to cross promote with the other books and like end up spending our money on, on someone else's company. And so that was kind of what I kept hearing. And it just got to the point where I was like, maybe if I keep trying to find someone who has a different perspective that, that some very small publishing house would, would, uh, would pick it up. But it just kind of, it, it got low enough on the, on the tier that it was like, is that even worth it? I mean, are people, just, are they going to even be able to help me do anything that I can't do? And it had been over a year and I was like, this just needs to end. Like there are people who read the burning world, like living was meant to come out the same year as the burning world. Like it burning world is very much a cliffhanger because the next one was supposed to come out like a few months later. Right. I had no intention that there was going to be years between this of people gradually wandering off. And so I was like, it just needs to come out for the readers and for my own sake, just to have some closure here and to have, the series be complete. And then my hope was that with the story being finished and people be able to see it as a completed object, that it would sort of retroactively gain some kind of like posthumous uh, momentum. And so, yeah, I just decided like, fuck it, basically, I'm just going to do it. And, and I knew that I wouldn't sell that much. You know, it's, it's hard to just dive into self-publishing without, you know, the infrastructure in place and the, I guess the the formula in place, because I know there there are plenty of respectable indie publishers. I mean, the authors who write good books, but a lot of that scene is sort of filled with very workmanlike books where people are just kind of, they have a formula and they're, they're not, it's not an insult to them. Like they would freely tell me this, like, here's the points you follow to success. You write this point here, this point, you have to do this many books a month. This is how you promote. And it's like, it's just, it's a business to them. And they have a, a point by point thing they can follow. So a lot of the ones that I hear from who are talking about, you know, making six figures or whatever, and people are telling me like, oh, you should just do this. You'll make six figures. And I look up the authors that they're talking about. I'm like, okay, but it's not what I do. Right. I can't do that. There's a very almost like kind of like TV or film approach, you know, whether it's like a save the cat kind of thing or, you know, like you said, a very workman, like they're working right. almost like episodically. They're just like, they're cranking out stuff. They hit the beats. They make the audience happy. They may not necessarily make always make memorable things, but they satisfy the appetite. But yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I think that there's a place for that. Certainly. I mean, like I, I watch plenty of, of TV. I, I don't, I don't read in that realm just because I read so slow. I, I take, I, it's a big commitment for me to take a book. So I can't really read popcorn books. I can watch popcorn film because it's low commitment, but I watch plenty of formulaic TV and, and I enjoy it, but it's like, it is a, different craft i think it's like people have different intentions for it and then different expectations and it's just not something that i'm interested in and even if i wanted to be i just don't think i have that technique so the traditional you know style of writing where you pour your heart and soul into it and spend years you know making a, a grand artistic statement are not well supported in indie publishing that does exist but i don't think that's the type of writing that most people are referring to when they show success stories. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little pessimistic about my situation. <laughs> I'm sure that's oozing out a little bit, but um, I basically decided like, I'm just going to go for it. I still have hopes that it could expand, you know, either through a traditional publisher or, you know, further self-publishing developments in, in the future. But for for now, I mean, I didn't even go the, the Amazon route. I'm, I'm literally hiring a printer to, print a couple thousand copies and I'm going to be packaging them and shipping them myself. So it's like old school, kind of where it all started for me, which is how I published my first couple books, including Warm Bodies, was just print them out and put them in mailers. That's what I'm doing for a complex and boring array of reasons that be, seemed like the most logical choice at the moment. But uh, it's pretty much just for the fans at this point. Like I, I have 
made some some promotion efforts and I'm running some ads and uh, and I'm hoping to pick up a few newcomers. That would be nice if that happens. But my primary concern is just like for the the readers who are who are already into this story. I just want it to to exist. Whatever happens with the indie route, it's possible that it could work out for me at some point. And maybe I'd I'd keep going. I do love the the freedom of it. And of course, you know, as much people love to talk about, you keep a lot more of the profits. Of course, you don't sell nearly as many copies, so it's kind of a trade off. But <laughs> it's a new frontier for me. I'm I'm dubious that it will be the way to go in the long run for me. I mean, if a good publisher wants to do my book well and and release it with promises of actually, you know, making an effort, I'm pretty sure I would take it. But for now, I'm making the best of the situation. You, you mentioned like the, the previous publisher kind of has the previous book. So if you went to a new publisher, they can't necessarily cross promote, like it's not like you could put out like a box set. Is it sort of like being a musician where the record label owns the masters and you, is there a certain point where you can claim back your previous books and, and be able to publish them your way? Or how does that work? Well, yeah, that's been something I've discussed a lot with my agent, and I would love to to reclaim them because that would totally change the change the game. I would probably be able to get a, a, a good publisher if, if they could re-release the whole series. And of course, I'd love to do like a box set or just any of the number of things you can do when they're all in house. I think that they would probably be happy to sell me back the Burning World <laughs> if I had money for it. But um, you know, they still are a long shot from even paying back their advance on that. So maybe they wouldn't, they might want to hang on to it just in case, you know, if another movie ever happens or something, but I'm pretty sure no matter what, they wouldn't want to part with foreign bodies because that's perpetual income. It, I mean, it's still, it doesn't sell much anymore, but it's still a trickle. And every time it pops up on sci-fi channel or something, they sell a few more thousand copies and that's a, you know, an asset in their company. And so I could probably get new hunger and burning world, but I don't see them ever parting with foreign bodies, so it's kind of pointless. It's very frustrating. I would love to save my children, but if I have to leave one behind, it, I might as well keep them in company with each other. Well, even like seeing where the story goes and how much it evolves past foreign bodies, like it's been adapted once, but like to me, it looks like an obvious Netflix or Hulu or HBO series. You know, like I feel like like there's there's still ripe room for adaptation. It's not that that should be the be all end all in the world of publishing, but it's a nice thing. Like you said, it, it introduces new people. But I, I also wonder too if there was a challenge for people where like warm bodies to a certain degree was marketed and felt like a standalone novel, and a lot of people. A lot of readers are like, they love series, but they're shy about getting into them for this very reason that you've run into, which is that sometimes those last books don't come out or publishers drop them or like, you know, there's a lot of readers that are super shy yeah. about committing to something that they think will never actually uh, complete. And a lot of readers that wait until something's done so they can just buy the box set or jump into it. I wonder if, if that was a confusing thing for readers too. That's I'm hoping. I mean, that's been kind of my last hope really with, with this thing turning around is that maybe now that it is complete, people will look at it a little differently. And I, I totally feel the same way. I mean, even with TV shows, a lot of times I'm I'm reluctant to even start a show until it's ended and people can tell me like, yep, it holds up through the whole thing because so many series in any medium, they start out really compelling and then they just kind of drag out until it's not until it's a waste of time. And so even if you do finish the whole thing, like I think back on my experience watching Lost exactly. and how I invested so much time and emotion into that story. And yet, because of the total disregard for the for the integrity of it towards the end, in retrospect, I feel like I just I wasted that time. Like it was it was, you know, a dump because to me, like I can't just enjoy chapter one through three and then like forget about chapter four. Like the story is the story. I don't really believe in an ongoing serial tale. Like it should have an arc. There should be a beginning and an end. And when the end isn't there, I'm a little skeptical because like the way the industry works in film and, and books, there isn't really a lot, a lot of emphasis on satisfying endings. People just kind of want to get you in the door, get the money. And then like milk it until it sucks basically <laughs> and that's been my so many serial storytelling it's like i go through all this effort and then they get to the point where like well we're gonna you know drag it out a little further because it's still making money and it's like well that's great for you but now my memory of that story is trashed forever and i feel like as a whole it was a waste of of, of my effort so i'm hoping that there's some customer confidence in seeing that the series is there seeing you know, it hasn't gotten reviews yet because it's not even really out yet, but hopefully it will get good reviews. People will like it and then they'll be like, okay, maybe I'll dive in here. 
that's how I would react. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely say that, you know, there is a passionate fan base for these books. I mean, I, I found them online. These the people that are like that these books matter a lot to them and your characters, your world matter to them. Uh, if you go to Goodreads now, there are a lot of people who have read The Living and uniformly it's it's four or five stars. Um, you know, the people that just absolutely um, enjoyed this, that it took them to new places. And there's a few people that may be puzzled by the, like you said, it's sort of a psychedelic ending to this, you know, to this whole story but um overall it seems like most people were along for the ride and 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 really enjoyed it as we wrap this up tell the audience where they should find your stuff where they should be buying the living and how they keep up with uh with what you do next well yeah that's a crucial point in this case because usually you know all my previous books are just like wherever books are sold yeah <laughs> and now it's like no no it's just my website like People keep sending me messages like, I'm trying to buy your book, but for some reason I can't find it in any Barnes and Nobles. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not out there. It's on my, on my site only. The ebook is, is available other places. But if you're talking about the actual book, it's just IsaacMarion.com. I'm literally selling them myself by hand. So don't expect it to show up in Walmart. It's not going to not. Don't wait around for a paperback. It's not. This is it. Like, this is, this is the book. So yeah, it's there. It's a, pretty elaborate release. It's going to be a really tricked out hardcover with a lot of cool little features that you can really only get from custom printings. It's going to be bundled. Well, you get it, you get the ebook for free. If you buy the hardcover, you automatically get a download of the ebook. So it's kind of like taking the vinyl record model there where you get both, you know, they're all going to be signed. They're going to be included with two short stories based on in the warm bodies world that are not published anywhere else. So it's going to be pretty fancy package. And um, yeah, it's a, it's available now. I mean, you can download the ebook now. Many people have started reading it. I've had an incredibly clumsy release where the release date keeps getting pushed back. Printers drop out on me. Uh, things, just pretty much everything that could go wrong has happened. But the actual book will be out in about a week and it'll be shipping it out hopefully in time for Christmas. So yeah, I'm on all the social medias and IsaacMarion.com. Awesome. Well, thank you, Isaac. People should be going out and follow. Like, I follow you on Twitter, and and so I, you know, follow your stuff there. I know you've got a newsletter too that lets everybody know, and you're really good about keeping people informed about what's happening with the books. And like you said, IsaacMarion.com in order to buy the book. That's definitely the most reliable way to if you actually want to stay in touch with them. Doing the email is pretty much the only way to know that you're actually going to get it because social media is not what it used to be. The the algorithm controls your life. It will tell you what you're interested in and what you're not. And oftentimes it will skip you if it doesn't think that you care about things you care about. So, so yeah, email is solid. Well, awesome. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. The people should be reading this series um, because again, fantastic prose, great characters, a well-realized world that goes places I think that will surprise them and delight them. And yeah, thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. Yeah, thanks a lot. Fictitious is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Buskey, and co-produced by Wendy Buskey. If you've got a few minutes to spare and would like to help out the show, here are a couple of ways to spread the word about Fictitious. One, you can leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And two, you can share a link to the show on Twitter, Facebook, or wherever you do your social networking thing. I can't stress enough how much those simple actions will help to spread the word about the show, which helps us grow and bring you more awesome author guests. And it also helps those writers reach new audiences. You can follow Fictitious on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all under the handle FictitiousPod. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. And you can find all of our episodes plus book reviews at FictitiousPodcast.com. Thanks for listening. More author conversations coming your way very soon. 